Adam's gaze upon Eve, as John Paul reflects on it, he says, they were naked and without shame. What's that mean? Here's, here's my schlep analogy, right? I'm in the shower, I'm washing my hair, and I hear this, come on in, I know it's a Murphy, and okay, so my three-year-old three -old son whips open the shower curtain, looks up at his mommy, naked in the shower, and says, mom, can I have a new cream bar? And I'm like, sure, <laughs> just have your sisters get it for you, don't go climbing on any cupboards, okay? That's scenario one. Scenario two, I'm in the shower, I'm washing my hair, by the way, and I hear this, not sure it's a Murphy knock, foolishly, come on in, and all of a sudden, Whoosh, whoops open the shower curtain. It's my mailman. Ma'am, may I have a new cream bar? Am I going to dialogue with the dude about where to find them? No, 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 of course not. Why? What What do I instinctively know that that, that mailman does not have that that three year old son looking up at his mom does have? What does that three year old son gazing at his mother have that the mailman is lacking in visiting the ocean? Which is a gaze, what is, what is his gaze upon me? One of what? Innocence. Beautiful. Beautiful. It's innocence. It's innocence. It's purity. This is the gaze of Adam for Eve. In fact, it, it, one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit that you receive to confirmation is, is called fear of the Lord. It's, it's also called wonder and awe, a better translation. Why? Fear of the Lord gives us this kind of image, wonder and awe. It's like reverence with trembling. That was Adam's gaze for Eve before the fall. Right? And, and, and then something happened. And they, they, why, did, why did the Father put the tree in the garden? That they might be able to choose love. If they don't have an active <coughs> way to reject the Father's plan or to reject the Father, then they don't free, they're not freely able to choose to love him each day. So he places this, this in their midst, but in a loving, protective stance says, do not eat it before the day you eat it, you shall die. Does he mean their bodies? No, he means the life of their souls with him, that communion they experience with him, walking face to face in the garden. However, Eve, she takes, grasps, she eats, she shares. And suddenly two things change in that garden. What are the two things that change? One is in reference to Adam and Eve, one another, and one is in reference to them and their God. Do you remember the two things that happen? What do they do for the first time in reference to each other? They realize that they're beautiful. They realize that they're naked. He gets a baseball cap and she gets some ugly boots, right? <laughs> no, not at all. In fact, what parts do they scurry to cover? The very, very parts that enable them to experience communion of persons. The very thing that made them like God and their ability to have the most intimate, exclusive, indissoluble communion two persons could actually have. So they scurry, scurry to cover those parts that were gift of self to one another. Suddenly their gaze is a little different too, Adam. He's going, oh, I'm going to baby, what you can do for me. Becomes a me monster. And Eve is like, um, well, uh, that all depends upon whether you're good and if you took out the garbage and sex becomes a weapon. So the whole plan for God, which is sex is meant to be an expression of self-donation, self-donative gift, Sex is meant to be actually the expression of divine wedding vows. We're going to take a look at that. Then all of a sudden, it becomes twisted or perverted. It stops to have the meaning for which it was made. Does that make sense? So, so two things happen. That's one of the things that happened. A second thing happens in that garden in reference to God. What do they do for the very first time? What do they do? Hide. They hide from God. And they're not playing <coughs> hide and seek. So the only explanation is they now find him. Afraid. They're afraid of him. They don't have that communion, that trust, that loving trust they once experienced in sharing their lives with him in the garden. Now they're running from him. Okay, what is the cause of this? John Paul may, takes pains to say what the cause of this. And he says, according to the faith, the disorder we notice so painfully in the male and female relationship does not stem from the nature of man and woman. It's not because man and woman are not incompatible. In fact, they are complementary. We need each other to have that communion with persons. That's not the reason. Nor is it the nature of their relations. It's not because he no longer satisfies me, she's no longer attractive to me, she doesn't excite me anymore. That's all a lie. He says the real root of the cause of the marital disharmony is sin. As a break with God, which is a good definition of sin, the first sin had for its consequence the rupture of the original communion between man and woman. All things go south in the garden. Between them and between them. 
So sin and selfishness is at the root. Keep in mind, sin is an archery term. And basically what it means is when I'm trying to hit that bullseye, I pull back my bow. If I, if I miss the target, it's a sin. What's the target? God's will. And only in that can I be happy. Here's, here's four important descriptions of, of love, qualities of love that John Paul gives us. I call them the non-negotiables because without them, it's a counterfeit. If you don't have these four qualities of love, you've got yourself a counterfeit. Here they are. The first one is that the love between the persons must be freely given. So it must be a free gift. Okay? Remember, Christ says before he goes to the cross, on the eve of, on, on, on the, at the Last Supper, he says, freely do I lay my life down for you. No one takes it from me. We need to hear that because we know the gift was freely given, not forced upon. All the more magnanimous a gift is it in that case. Okay? And the love between the spouses must be freely given. It can't be an arranged, forced union, or else their freedom is not attached, no freedom, no love. The next one is that the gift of love between the spouses must be total. Christ did not go partially. He didn't do half measures. When he was asked to ransom us by giving up his life, he not only gave up his life, he gave it to the last breath, drop of blood. He also literally suffered agonizing torment, emotional and physical, which led to that complete gift of sin. So the love must be total. Next, the love must be faithful. So, he says, after having made a complete self donative gift of himself on the cross, he goes and gives himself in the Eucharist to continue to be a self donative gift. And those of us who desire can receive that gift daily if we desire. Daily if we desire. He continues to pour himself out as gift in Holy Communion. He's faithful, and at the Ascension says, I go to prepare a place for you. My Father has many mansions. He's all about us, even in, in, in the re even after the resurrection. Even not just in death, but after the resurrection. And the last is that the love between the spouses must be fruitful. Okay? And, and why? Because keep in mind, Christ, when he ransomed us, he literally provided a family for the Father in heaven. When the gates of heaven were barred by Adam and Eve, the father could not receive the sons and daughters that were intended for him for since the beginning of time. What Christ did, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit, the, the gates of heaven blew wide open. And yes, even that good thief, today you shall be with me in paradise, becomes an adopted son of the father. So the father has now a great family. Those are the four non-negotiables. I'm going to propose to you something. A major shift in our understanding of the human person, as well as a major shift in our understanding of human sexuality took place to our detriment at the sexual revolution. We believed not in freedom, but in license. If we could have what we wanted, when we wanted, whenever we wanted, however we wanted, we would be truly happy. And if that were the case, then you could look around yourselves today and see extraordinarily joy-filled marriages and extraordinarily joyful families and happy relationships. Are we seeing this? Are we seeing that or not? I agree with you. I agree with you. Why? I also propose this. Because what the sexual revolution did was it told us a lie about human sexuality and the person. The lie it told us about the person is the person is for pleasure. This is a lie about college, right? The person as pleasure. If you don't believe me, just take a walk through the mall. At any point, you can be standing in front of a large and life-size poster of, of a woman wearing, sometimes, nothing but a set of wings. Where are you? Yeah, and well, guess what they don't sell at Victoria's Secret? Wings. Okay, but what are they trying to sell in that window? Go a little bit further down the mall to Abercrombie and Filth or Hollister. What do you see? You see, a, you see that's Jason Everton. He's really good. Okay, what, what do you see? You see these absolutely gloriously fitted bods with six packs and a lot of oil. Guess what they don't sell in that store? Six packs of oil. So what are they selling you? They're selling you a lie about the human person. The person as pleasure. The person for arousal. But they're not selling you the person as gift. Okay? And the other thing they're doing is they're saying sex is the means by which you get that pleasure. They're selling sex. It's clear when you walk into those, if you, if you look with the eyes, if you look with the eyes of the heart. Right? So that, that, that lie has pervaded the culture. And what we've done is we've redefined it. And Cosmopolitan, all you have to do is take a look at the front cover of that magazine. It literally, it literally diminishes sex down to how great a hit you can get at the end of it all. That's it. You, you can always, always find tips on Cosmo on how to improve your, your climax. It's obsessed. And it won't offer you a bigger, 
better view of sex. I tell you now, it will offer you a reductionist view of sex in the human person. And that reductionist view has led to all kinds of sexual trouble, particularly addictions. Bob has met some, met, mentioned some of them. You guys, pornography is a pandemic. It's a pandemic right now for them. And, and it, yes, it is addictive. But it's not wrong because it's addictive. It's addictive, therefore it's harmful. But it's wrong because it robs you of the ability to love authentically. It robs you of the ability. That's huge. That's huge. So it has incredible consequences. And ladies, those of us who put pay, pay full price down to see Christian Grey literally bought the lie as well. We bought the lie as well. So any stories of pornography, be it female or male, are going to rob you of the capacity to love authentically. How freely, totally, faithfully, and fruitfully. Because instead of being a gift of self, we're preoccupied with our own pleasure and become a wee monster. We forget that there's a human being at the other side. Does that make sense? So here's, here's what John Paul suggests. And I'm, I'm trying to get a lot in it. At, 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 at why are these so important? Keep in mind the four things you're going to be asked if you choose to marry. These are, they're prepared to be asked, are you going to love as Christ loves? Have you come here freely and without reservation? Totally. Will you love each other till death? You part. No, you can't kill each other. I guess convenient. Right? And will you accept children lovingly that are sent you by God? You're going to promise to love exactly the way God loves. And then you're asked by the church to go home and back up with your bodies what you just promised you imagine your and hearts. Guess what happens? Remember the incarnation, where the Word, the second person of the Blessed Trinity, becomes flesh in the womb of a woman? That's what's going to happen. Your words become flesh. You literally begin to incarnate your wedding vows together. Some obstacles also exist to that promise to one another. And one of the biggest obstacles that exists, that's often misunderstood, and more and more couples who are preparing for marriage are saying, wow, I don't want any part of that. I want the real deal. I don't want any counterfeits. A counterfeit, something that would rob you of freedom and totality, and ultimately, in many cases, fidelity and fruitfulness is contraception. And this is precisely why the church has come out and said, this is going to do you tremendous harm.